A nuclear holocaust has been our worst fear for decades. Prophets of doom have now raised the specter of a different kind of holocaust, a swift and lethal plague that no vaccine or drug can stop. Is such a nightmare possible? While no scientist believes that entire cities could be wiped out, a menacing threat to human life is re-emerging. Deadly viruses, bacteria, and parasites are returning to haunt us. Every corner of the world is now within reach. Exotic microbes can travel from the heart of Africa to New York City in a single day. In a world of changing climate and surging populations, microbes are finding new openings to infect us and spread. It's a battle, us against them. We've already engaged the enemy, here, in the heart of America, on Navajo Nation lands. The outbreak was fast and fatal, taking the young in their prime. He was an athlete. He had been previously healthy. In fact, he was in excellent physical condition. When I came to the emergency room that Friday, I was shown the body of a 19-year-old Native American. The doctors told me a little bit more about this young man, and they said that he had been brought by ambulance from the small town of Thiru, which is about 30 miles east of Gallup. They rushed him to the hospital with CPR in progress, and when they got him here, the doctors continued a resuscitation protocol, but they weren't able to revive him. One, two, three. Except for some flu-like symptoms, headaches, fever, muscle aches, vomiting, he didn't really have any medical history at all. Looks too young to have a pulmonary edema, right? Oh. Let's give him the atropine and flush it through, okay? Heart rate's 47. Okay, well, blood pressure's going down. He was the kind of person that a lot of us wish that we were because he was very healthy and very athletic. He was a runner, a track star. The air entry into his chest at all? From talking to his family, I realized that he had fallen ill three days earlier with these flu-like symptoms and that he hadn't worried much about it initially because he thought he just had the flu and as most people know there really isn't too much you can do to treat the flu except to wait it out. Everybody clear? Maybe myself? Okay, I think we should call the code Dave, Cheryl, you agree? Okay, all right, let's just disconnect everything. I'm afraid it's gone. There's nothing we can do about that. I found the family in one of the small waiting rooms here at the hospital and I sat down to talk to them and they said they were on their way into Gallup to attend a funeral. And I thought, oh, that's terrible. And then a little bit farther in the conversation, I asked them whose funeral they were coming to attend and they told me that it was this young man's fiance's funeral. And I thought, boy, that is tragic. So I asked them what happened to her and they told me that she had died of almost identically the same thing three or four days earlier. And it was then that I realized that something was going on because the two cases were so closely related. The chills went down my spine and I asked them to tell me a little bit more about that case. And they told me that she was 21 years old, was also very healthy, was a runner in her own right, and that up until the time that she got sick, three or four days before her death, she didn't have a medical history either. And to make matters worse, they told me that her funeral was scheduled to start in 30 minutes. I called the mortuary, which fortunately was very nearby, and I alerted the funeral director as to what we needed to do. When I got to the mortuary, he had assembled the uh, very close family members in a meeting room. I asked them for permission to do an autopsy. And as soon as the funeral service itself was over, we took that young woman, the young man from the emergency room, and we rushed them by ambulance to Albuquerque. Pathologist Dr. Patricia McFeely took charge of the bodies. When they came in, they didn't look that different. I mean, they were both young people. Um, she, was, she had been embalmed and was ready for burial. Um, he uh, you know, looked like a very healthy person. 
but who had died very suddenly. So there wasn't anything that gave you any special clues or, or made, any, made you suspicious of anything. We looked through some of the blood and lung specimens that we had and really went through the whole bank of tests that we could do for known diseases. It wasn't plague like we thought it might have been. It wasn't a meningitis like it could have been. The things that you would think both would kill somebody very quickly. And so when we didn't find any of those, we were a little surprised. The body is that of a well-developed, well-nourished young adult uh, Indian male who weighs 173 pounds at 72 inches in height and appears compatible with the stated age of uh, 21 years. Both of them had heavy lungs. They were filled with fluid and they were kind of floating in a in fluid in the chest, which was really abnormal. They weren't in a position to have heart failure or something, which is the kind of time you'd see that. They also had some bleeding into their stomachs, and so we were concerned that they had maybe taken a poison, probably unintentionally, so we were concerned. And it was really frustrating. And you feel like, how come you're not smart enough? How come you can't figure this out? This, is, this shouldn't be this hard. New victims of the mystery disease soon followed. Within a week, two more family members fell ill, then others around the city of Gallup. Was this the beginning of a major outbreak? The sick were flown to University Hospital in Albuquerque, where doctors confronted a fast-acting illness unlike anything they'd ever seen. Some thought the disease was spread only by the Navajo, but they were quickly proved wrong. One of its first victims and few survivors was Robert Heron. I knew I wouldn't make it unless I got to Albuquerque. The hospital in Gallup had not the, the, the care that I needed. I knew it was too late to pray. And I said, Lord, whatever you want is fine with me. They started plugging me into all sorts of things. They gave me a, a paralyzing drug that would help my system relax, help the muscles to relax, and so they could breathe, take in the oxygen that was being rammed down my throat. <clears throat> they later that day thought I had a heart attack, which later the heart doctor said it was just the fluid in my lungs that was stopping the heart from beating. And over the next six days, it took four and a half gallons of fluid off my lungs. The mystery grew. As the suspected case list mounted to more than a dozen, state health experts met in emergency sessions. Dr. Gary Simpson was a leader of the task force. After a fairly involved facilitated discussion, we really arrived at three uh, possible diagnoses of radiological agents. One of them was influenza A, and although there wasn't a strong sense that this was likely, we still all remembered that in 1918, 1919, that the in, that influenza pandemic had killed uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people throughout the world. And there was influenza A in our community at that time. The second was a possible viral hemorrhagic fever agent. Now, there had never been viral hemorrhagic fever agents causing illness that we knew of in North America, but it was uh, a family of agents that could kill young people in this very rapid uh, manner. And the third was uh, either some unknown infectious or toxic agent that had never been described before. The state turned to the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta for help. CDC tested blood samples from victims against hundreds of infectious and toxic agents. A virus was the chief suspect, but which one? Navajo healers were also searching for the cause from their own perspective. Their traditions say that health depends on a delicate balance between forces in the universe. When that balance is upset, retribution is required. And the price is a life.
The agent of retribution is a tiny but respected creature, the mouse. Among the Navajo, the mouse figures in a major portion in the creation story where when the world was first being formed, the mouse went to the four corners of the world where carrying seeds and uh, by spreading the seeds around it created this uh, uh, ecosystem, the, uh, the plants that humans and other animals depend on. And because of that, it has a, it's considered a, in a sense a creator itself and has lays claim to all that has come from that. But what could a mouse have to do with the mystery disease? Navajo healers had seen outbreaks like this before. In 1918 and 1933, high rain and snowfall swelled streams and produced abundant spring growth. There were bumper crops of piñon pine nuts, a food staple for mice. Their populations exploded. The result was increased contact between mice and humans. According to Navajo tradition, mice and humans represent two powerful spheres of influence that should remain separate. In this world, humans live in the day cycle and they uh, sleep in their hogans uh, in the evening. And mice, on the other hand, they sleep in the daytime and they wander around throughout the outside world, but they must never enter the hogans. Or uh, illness will occur when mice come to uh, contact with humans and uh, spread contamination. The contamination, <clears throat> according to the uh, traditional healers I talked to were spread when a mouse, uh, through mouse uh, fe feces, uh, urine, and saliva. And there was an old saying that uh, when a mouse runs over your clothing, you must uh, burn it. And nobody could understand why, but uh, when I asked the healer, they said, well, when a mouse runs over your clothing in the middle of the night, the chances are that it's frightened, and it's probably leaving a spray of uh, aerosolized urine and uh, that will fall on your clothing, and there's a good chance that you may become very ill or die if you don't burn that clothing because it's contaminated. Meanwhile, the CDC was reaching a similar conclusion from a radically different perspective. With help from biosafety labs, they identified the infectious agent as a hantavirus, a viral hemorrhagic fever. It usually targets the kidneys, but this form attacks the lungs. The virus lives and reproduces in rodents. Scientists have a simple theory on how it jumps into humans. When rodents enter human dwellings, they shed the virus through urine and feces. When unsuspecting humans enter that space, they stir up infected dust and breathe in deadly virus particles. A virus depends completely on the living cell for survival. Hantavirus evades the body's immune defenses, and eventually a living cell embraces it. Inside the cell, Hantavirus springs to life. It uses the cell's energy and internal machinery to make countless copies of itself. The cell releases those deadly replicas to invade the rest of the body, targeting small blood vessels. For reasons not yet understood, the virus causes the vessels in the lungs to leak, quickly drowning its victim in fluid. The strategy is fast and relentless. To prove the mouse connection, Biologists from the University of New Mexico and the CDC trapped rodents and tested them for infection. Protected in biosafety suits, the team carefully sampled the region. Biologist Terry Yates led the investigation. This new species of hantavirus occurs in a mouse called the deer mouse. The deer mice are rodents that occur in almost every habitat in North America. They're very common. They live in this pinon juniper type habitat. They also live in grasslands and on tops of mountains and in river valleys. Uh, an extremely common rodent, they come into people's houses, especially in the fall of the year when it starts getting cool or in the spring. When the young are born and they uh, start looking for new places to live, 
they are likely to come into somebody's house to live, especially if there's a lot of good things to eat there and nice places to make nests. Well, we've got a manipulate us over here. What'd you get? So if you're going to have a, an, a mouse to live in, hantavirus couldn't pick a better one than the deer mouse. Many local deer mice carry hantavirus, but aren't killed by it. Factors such as changing weather patterns can make it easier for the virus to jump from mice to humans. There seems to be a, a, a strong correlation between change and the outbreaks of, of new viruses. It appears to us that uh, climate change uh, is playing a very strong role in uh, viral outbreaks, especially hantavirus outbreaks in, in the southwestern United States. In 1993, New Mexico once again had an unusually mild wet winter and spring. The food supply for mice increased, triggering a population explosion. The result, as Navajo healers understood, was more interactions between humans and mice. But the problem isn't confined to the Southwest. We've had human cases of this hantavirus in 23 states now in the United States, and, and the mouse literally lives throughout most of the North American continent. So uh, anyone sweeping a dusty cabin highly infected with deer mice has a, is at risk from catching uh, the virus. Uh, it's not something that is restricted to the Four Corners region of New Mexico. Over the course of the outbreak, 115 cases of hantavirus were confirmed nationwide, most of them from the southwest. Of these cases, 59 died. Survivors like Robert Heron fully recovered. Rainfall returned to normal, and rodent populations shrank, reducing encounters between mice and humans. But hantavirus isn't gone. It's still lurking in the background. Far from the desert southwest, Baltimore seems an unlikely place to find hantavirus. But hantaviruses infect many rodents, including the rats that live here. Baltimore, like every other port, has been infested with Norway rats since the first European ships sailed in. Biologists from Johns Hopkins University are patrolling the neglected alleyways of Baltimore to assess the threat from rodents. What do you think about over here? Yeah. yeah. Gregory Gurry Glass is known to local residents as the Rat Man. Norway rats or brown rats are found in all the major urban areas in the United States. And studies that have been done in Philadelphia and New Orleans and Houston as well as Baltimore have shown that rats there are infected with hantaviruses. And we suspect probably everywhere that these rats exist, they're infected with hantaviruses. Yeah, just listen for the noises. Uh, whoop, whoop. Hello there. Oh, yes, Each night, Gurry Glass and his colleague pursue their quarry and each night offers up qualified subjects for his study. This is a Norway rat. This is what's also called the brown rat, or ratus norvegicus, or all those other things. And what you can see is he, this is sort of the typical rat that you find out in the alley. He's got a big gaping wound here that he picked up. He's been bitten on his hands a couple times. He's got a big abscess here. Uh, he's got a big bite wound here. I think just you know, that they manage to survive under the circumstances that they do. Having to live that way is at least interesting, if, if not lovable. Uh, at least you can sort of respect them a bit. Blood from Baltimore's rats revealed the first evidence of hantavirus in a large American city. It was different from the southwestern strain, and most rats carried it. But had it made the jump from rats to humans? And was it causing disease? Gurry Glass drew blood from a sample of Baltimore's residents and estimated that over 2,000 of them had been infected with hantavirus at some time in their lives. Because most hantaviruses target the kidneys, Gurry Glass took a close look at people with serious kidney disease. The picture was alarming. People with serious kidney disease were 10 times more likely to have been infected with hantavirus. Gurry Glass realized that this strain of hantavirus could be a slow, stealthy killer. It was probably killing people for decades, but so surreptitiously that no one had noticed it. 
I think what this tells us about infectious agents and disease is that, in fact, infectious agents produce a broad range of illnesses from very immediate, severe types of disease that we tend to think of to perhaps more long-term uh, sorts of effects. Uh, we wouldn't have thought probably many years ago that, for instance, ulcers were caused by infectious agents. Uh, most of us didn't think a few years ago that cervical cancer, one of the leading causes of cancer in women, was caused by an infectious agent, and yet we now know that they are. The hantavirus story reveals that viruses and bacteria work their mischief in a surprising number of ways. They can kill swiftly and surely in epidemics that make headlines. But they can also act slowly and insidiously in a way that is hard for scientists to detect. Viruses and bacteria have evolved with humanity over millions of years in an unseen world. Our modern society is just beginning to appreciate what the Navajo have taught for centuries. That life is a precarious balance between tightly interconnected worlds. We upset that balance at our own peril. For all its playfulness, this children's rhyme originated with a terrible event, the plague. The rosy ring was a telltale rash. Posies were herbs and spices carried to ward off disease. And sneezes were the first symptoms of this deadly bacterial infection. Plague wiped out a third of Europe's population in the 1700s. Even simple bacterial infections were fatal until antibiotics were developed. But the power of antibiotics is fading. Deadly bacterial infections are back, and they're targeting our children. It happened very, very quickly. It was from a matter of waking up in the morning with a child that looked like he might have a virus to four o'clock in the afternoon being in the emergency room with a child who looked as if he might die at any moment. I put him to bed that night, he was wonderful. Five, six hours later and my child's on the verge of dying. And they told me that they didn't know if she would live for 30 minutes or three days or three weeks or what. La Bonner Children's Medical Center in Memphis, Tennessee is battling the new bacterial menace. Here, they're using every approach to healing. La Bonner is fighting to protect children against new strains of bacteria that our drugs can't cure. Somebody's been kissing on me. <laughs> Dr. Joan Chesney specializes in treating this growing threat to children's health. Hi. Hi. Mrs. Harper, I'm Dr. Chesney. I'm with infectious diseases and Mr. Harper. Nice Hi. to meet you. Savannah Harper has drug-resistant pneumonia and a blood infection. She's in critical condition. We've been here about 13 days now. Mama's baby. Love you. This is the culprit, a bacterium called pneumococcus. All kids carry these bugs. They not only cause ear and sinus conditions, but also life-threatening blood infections, meningitis, and pneumonia. And new drug-resistant strains are extremely difficult to treat, putting children like Savannah in serious danger. Bacteria are Earth's most ancient and numerous creatures. 
Their ancestors first appeared three and a half billion years ago. Some, like these spirulina, are popular health foods. But for other bacteria, we are the chosen food. And when bugs like this flesh-eating strep get hungry, we get sick with tuberculosis, cholera, tetanus, and many more, all of them dreaded scourges, until we found a seemingly perfect new weapon in the 1940s. Through mass production methods, America is continually increasing its output of penicillin, a new drug that affects almost miraculous cures. Doctors thought they had bacteria under control forever. Wartime medical discovery. Science has won another victory over death. But they were wrong. Angela Alexander was one of the first parents in this country to face the failure of antibiotics and the tragic results it can have on our children. Her daughter Shauna came down with pneumococcal meningitis, a serious brain and spinal cord infection. Even worse, the infection was drug resistant. Something was wrong. I knew something was wrong. It happened so fast. She had fever and she was dehydrated and it was frying her brain. She was started on antibiotics and normally we would expect within about two to three days that the fever would be coming down and that she would become more responsive. Her head was drawn back like this. And if you, you couldn't move it, it would break it if you moved her head. And all she kept saying was, mama, mama. She continued to be relatively unresponsive, to have a high fever, and the intensive care unit physicians became very concerned. And they would give her medicine and stuff, and they were still giving her antibiotics. It was only then that we asked the laboratory to do some very sophisticated testing to tell us whether this organism was in fact susceptible to the usual antibiotics. And it was at that point that we discovered that it was not. And I looked down at her and her eyes were rolled back in her head. And um, they made me leave and they took her to ICU. When we added a very potent antibiotic, um, she began to respond, but unfortunately with meningitis, the damage can be extensive fairly early on. She stayed there and she never got better. She's blind, she can't hear, she just lays there. The only thing she does is breathe, she can't even eat. What happened to Shauna? Her body rallied its defenses like this white blood cell that engulfs and digests invading bacteria. But in serious infections like Shauna's, white cells are overwhelmed and many die. That's where antibiotics come into play. Penicillin, for example, causes bacteria to burst without harming human cells at all. The perfect magic bullet until recently. Experts like Dr. Stuart Levy of Tufts University have watched the magic fade. When we began using antibiotics, penicillin being the first, bacteria all over were susceptible. It was easy. Today, we find all these bacteria out there which are resistant not just to penicillin, but to many different antibiotics. Why? Because they've survived. They have found ways to not be touched by the antibiotic. While we're trying to target with our weaponry all of these bacteria, they're changing. It's almost like a video game. The players in this life and death game are invading bacterial bugs, the body's white blood cell defenses, and antibiotic magic bullets. When bacteria invade, the body's white cells attack them and kill the infection. If the bacteria seem to be winning, antibiotic magic bullets are brought into play. The combined forces kill all the bacteria, even these red mutants that are immune. If the drug attack is stopped too soon, 
resistant bacteria survive. Now the first magic bullet isn't enough. So we change weapons. We fire new magic bullets until there are few weapons left in the arsenal. And this game never ends because bacteria are always out there, evolving. And they keep changing and they keep adding resistances. So in the end, you can end up with a bacterium resistant to eight different antibiotics. There aren't too many left. There are no more buttons to push. To make matters worse, resistance is spreading quickly. The first resistant pneumococci appeared in New Guinea in 1967. Over the next 20 years, it invaded South Africa, Europe, and finally the US in 1989, landing in Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Memphis. When resistant pneumococcal strains showed up here, they thrived. It's easy to see how. Much to parents' chagrin, infants and toddlers explore the world with their mouths and their hands. So kids constantly expose themselves to every bug carried by playmates. The more they take antibiotics, the more likely it is that resistant bacteria will appear and spread like wildfire. By the time Craig got meningitis, doctors knew about drug resistance. So when he didn't respond to standard drugs, they quickly switched to newer ones. His doctors reacted in time to stop the infection, but not quite quickly enough. He couldn't do anything. My baby that could walk and was starting to talk now couldn't even hold his head up by himself. He couldn't sit up, he couldn't roll over. You know, he couldn't say, Mama, he couldn't do anything. This was just like bringing home a newborn all over again. All right, can you put it together for me? Craig still takes medications to control a thyroid condition, seizures, and hyperactivity. Good work, Craig, good work. But intensive therapy and love have helped Craig make remarkable progress. What color is that one? What color is, that one? What color is this one? Blue, very good. And this one is... One of the newest magic bullets saved Craig's life. But if overused, this drug, too, will become ineffective. And the inventory of new drugs is running low. Until recently, few drug companies found it profitable to support the long-term research needed to develop new antibiotics. During the past three or four decades, we've been fortunate in being able to have new antibiotics being discovered and put into use almost every year. In the present decade, the 1990s, there are no new antibiotics coming on market, and they won't be there probably, if we're lucky, into the next century. So we have to use the ones we have. Now, if we start using the newer ones, I mean, we've already started them, but the newer ones, as much as we've used some of the older ones, bacteria are going to become resistant. Hello. Hello. How's she doing today? The situation is a growing worry for Dr. Keith English, director of infectious disease research at Le Bonheur. Favor, she's out running around today. He believes that Shauna and Craig are just the beginning of a problem that is steadily getting worse. Go. Good. When I first came to uh, Memphis uh, in 1990, the first patients uh, with drug-resistant pneumococcal meningitis had just been identified a few months before that. Since that time, antibiotic resistance uh, of this organism has been an increasing problem, such that we now have more than one-third of our pneumococcal organisms resistant to penicillin. Uh, we emphasize in our education of medical students and residents in pediatrics that these changes in antibiotic susceptibility patterns require us to be constantly alert uh, to the possibility that traditional treatments for many childhood infections may no longer be effective. Good. I'm so glad to see she's doing better. Thank you. You're welcome. Young patients are doing better now, thanks to a new treatment strategy. Children with serious infections are treated with combinations of new antibiotics right from the start. It's a double outlet right ventricle and started her on some uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. At the same time, the bacteria are tested for antibiotic sensitivity. Each of these paper strips contains a different antibiotic. By interpreting patterns of bacterial growth around the strips, 
Doctors can see how effective each drug is against the particular strain in that patient. If the bugs are not resistant, doctors switch back to an older drug that can control the infection. If they are resistant, doctors keep hitting them hard with the latest antibiotics. This protects the patient and discourages new resistance. The new strategy has brought Savannah's drug-resistant pneumonia under control. How's she doing today? She's better since she's been extubated. She's a febrile. Though still very weak, Savannah is on the road to complete recovery. It's okay. It's all right. The success of this approach is important because pneumococci aren't the only drug-resistant bugs around. I have nightmares all the time about having to treat children with infections which are no longer susceptible uh, to the available antibiotics. So far, we've been lucky. Resistant bacteria have not become common outside of hot spots like Memphis. To keep it that way requires changing our attitude about using antibiotics. We should not demand them of our physician. We should use them as prescribed. We shouldn't stockpile them, and we shouldn't give them to other people. If we do just that, we will prevent the overuse and misuse of antibiotics and will eliminate a major, maybe 50, 60 percent of the problem of resistance due to antibiotic use. If you have not yet seen a serious infection due to an organism which is resistant, you will. If we don't very soon have vaccines that can prevent some of these infections and new antibiotics that can treat these infections, that we may well return to the pre-antibiotic era, and, uh, at which uh, time we can anticipate seeing uh, children who are severely disabled and a number of children who may die of what used to be very simple to treat infections. This is a killer, and it's in your neighborhood. Mosquitoes have buzzed in our ears and left itchy marks on our skin ever since humans first roamed the Earth. Most of the time, they're a minor irritation. But mosquitoes are more than a nuisance. Worldwide, 450 million people suffer from mosquito-borne illnesses. Malaria, a disease spread by mosquitoes, kills more than 2 million people every year. No other animal inflicts more death and disease on humans. The mosquito is everywhere, a stealthy presence roaming through our gardens and homes, seeking out its next blood meal. Some types of mosquito can sense the warmth of a living creature from as far away as 30 feet. Science faces a formidable challenge as it battles the mosquito, and the struggle has taken on new urgency. Today, the mosquito is poised to bring an old scourge back to the U.S., dengue fever, a painful tropical disease that can be lethal. McAllen, Texas, a rapidly growing community on the U.S.-Mexico border. On the Mexican side, there's an epidemic of dengue, and McAllen is vulnerable because it has the right mosquitoes and the right conditions for breeding. The Centers for Disease Control is watching McAllen closely for signs of dengue's arrival in the U.S. Dengue is a hard disease to control because of the way it spreads. If mosquitoes bite a person who already has the disease, they pick up the virus and then pass it on to the next person they bite. It's a vicious cycle. The 
The CDC is analyzing hundreds of blood samples from suspected dengue cases in Texas. It could enter the U.S. at any moment. The CDC is so concerned, they run a lab in Puerto Rico devoted to investigating dengue. Last year, Puerto Rico had over 24,000 suspected cases, so it's the perfect place to study the disease and the mosquitoes that carry it. Dr. Paul Ryder is an epidemic troubleshooter who works at the CDC's special lab in San Juan. Dr. Ryder raises 10,000 mosquitoes a week for research. Most of his work concentrates on one species, Aedes aegypti, or yellow fever mosquito, and one sex, the female. You may find this uh, strange to understand, but I find the, the, the private life of the, the female mosquito very fascinating. The female mosquito is perfectly happy to feed entirely on blood. She gets her protein from blood and she gets her energy from blood. And I suppose it's not so surprising when you think that she's living surrounded by blood. The female is responsible for the nasty red welts on our skin. Only the females bite. The males feed on nectar. The female has an efficient feeding tool, a trough-like sucking device called a proboscis. She saws through the skin surface and probes for blood. Each plunge injects saliva under the skin. That's what causes itching, and since her saliva is home to the dengue virus, it causes infection, too. Dr. Jaime de Seda is an infectious disease specialist in San Juan. His young patient, Raisa, is recovering from dengue. She had very bad flu-like symptoms for about a week. But de Seda knows from his own experience that dengue can be much worse. Yucky. I had high fever, I had a sore throat, I have headaches and incredible body pains. It's called breakbone fever, and I can't understand why. It's very severe, so for a number of days I was in bed, I couldn't move, I couldn't do anything, I couldn't think straight, so it was quite severe. <coughs> severe dengue, or dengue hemorrhagic fever, has Dr. DeSeda worried about amaryllis. This is her second case, and her symptoms are worse than last time. There are four types of dengue fever, so you can get dengue four times in your life. Those who've had it more than once are most at risk for hemorrhagic fever. This form of the disease can lead to shock and death. The United States hasn't seen a serious outbreak of dengue since the 1930s, but it's poised to invade our shores again. The new threat can be traced back to the turmoil of an old war. World War II. Bombing raids bring chaos to the cities and countryside of Southeast Asia, where dengue is endemic. Refugees and soldiers constantly on the move depended on water stored in tanks and barrels, perfect breeding grounds for mosquitoes. As the troops and refugees picked up the disease and moved on, dengue spread throughout Asia and the tropics eventually infecting mosquitoes in 50 countries. Dengue spread relentlessly because of the mosquito's amazing adaptability. There are 3,000 different species of mosquitoes in the world, each one shaped by the conditions of its own special habitat. In the forest, you can find their larvae in tiny pools of water inside bromeliads. or in the cool protection of water lettuce roots. In fact, any place where there's standing water. They even live in crab holes. The female mosquito is a breeding machine. She can lay up to 300 eggs after a blood meal. 
Dengue-carrying Egyptes lay their eggs close to water, where the eggs rest until a rainfall occurs. When they are flooded, they begin to develop. Within a few days, eggs hatch into larvae. Within a week, they develop into pupae, the stage in which they change from aquatic creatures to airborne insects. At the end of that stage, the insect emerges in a matter of minutes. The adult lives for a few weeks. The dengue mosquito has tied its fate closely to that of humans. It prefers the artificial containers that we provide for breeding sites, funeral flower vases, spare tires, and bird baths are particular favorites. It's really a very clever mosquito. Um, it's uh, adapted its life so closely to our life um, that really it has everything. It's like a, like, a, like a boy in an ice cream store. It has its food close by, lots of people to bite. Um, it has, unfortunately, lots of breeding sites uh, to exploit. And it has a wonderful resting site. And it spends a lot of its time uh, hidden away, resting uh, indoors. In Puerto Rico, mosquito control is serious business. Spraying insecticide and eliminating breeding sites are the standard responses to any outbreak of mosquito-borne disease. But those methods aren't working on the stealthy mosquitoes here. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Dr. Ryder and his associate, Manuel Amador, are determined to figure out why the standard control methods aren't working. Donning his bug-busting vacuum pack, Ryder is following the trail of the bloodsuckers into Puerto Rican homes. The mosquito is often called the yellow fever mosquito. I think that we should rename it the tropical closet mosquito. It's a closet species. It lives and hides among clothing in closets more often than anything else in the house. To expect an aerosol of insecticide that is really at the mercy of the nuances of, of wind movement to be delivered in quantity to a mosquito that's sitting among your clothing in the closet doesn't seem to make sense, does it? When we use these aerosol sprays from airplanes or vehicles, the insect has to be flying and has to actually fly through. Uh, the aerosol in order to pick up particles of aerosol in order then uh, to, to be killed. So these aerosol particles don't last very long in the air. Unfortunately many governments have put much of their resources um, into, into these spraying machines uh, which unfortunately have very little impact on the dengue mosquito. Conventional ideas about controlling mosquitoes turn on basic assumptions about their egg laying and flight behavior. It's assumed that after a blood meal, the female lays all her eggs at once. It's also assumed that she doesn't fly more than 100 yards from where she hatched. The renegade rider questions these assumptions, and he's come up with a clever way to track a gypti in the wild. First, he feeds uninfected lab mosquitoes a good blood meal. It's laced with rubidium, a trace metal that the mosquitoes then leave behind in their eggs. Returning to the scene of their bug-busting exploits, they release a few dozen rubidium-marked mosquitoes. They leave egg traps at every other house in the neighborhood. The traps imitate the female's favorite breeding sites. Every day, Amador replaces the traps with fresh ones and takes the day's egg catch back to the lab. He meticulously counts the number of eggs left in each trap. 
Then he puts the eggs from that trap through an atomic emission spectrophotometer. As the machine vaporizes the eggs, various elements give off distinctively colored flames. So when the flame turns red, Amador knows that the eggs were laid by rubidium-marked mosquitoes. The results of the experiment are surprising. Two dozen rubidium-marked mosquitoes were released in front of one house in this neighborhood. The first day after release, rubidium-marked eggs were collected from 54 different sites, not two dozen as expected. And on days two, three, and four, the mosquitoes continued to lay eggs much farther than 100 yards from the release site. When she's ready to lay her eggs, she doesn't lay all her eggs in one basket. Quite sensibly, perhaps, she uh, distributes them around many different sites. And this takes quite a long time. It seems to take uh, a number of days. We've deduced that the mosquito is actually flying quite long distances, much further than the 50 to 100 yards that's uh, been generally assumed to be the case. This is very important um, from the point of view of the spread of disease as well as from the problems of, of, of control. This is unwelcome news. It means that the normal ways of controlling the spread of dengue aren't